So you take issue, Ari, with the ban on priests who have disabilities or bushy eyebrows or diverse bodies in a variety of ways, the ban on them from serving in the tabernacle. And every year we grapple with these verses as they are difficult. How could the same God who created all human beings in God's own image also rule out some of those human forms from being closest to God? These verses do not align with our understanding of God, but they do very much align with what we know about ancient human societies and beliefs and their beliefs. We know that the ancients, not just the Hebrews, but many societies believed that unusual human features or disabilities were a sign of ignorance or sin or lack of blessing or even the demonic. The assumption was that outward appearance and inner essence were one imperfections or flaws in the body were seen as reflections of imperfections in the soul. I can only see one conclusion that we can draw from this, that the Torah reflects human bias and human limitations. Whether it's as Maimonides says, that the ban on disabled or diverse priests was an accommodation of the bias of the masses, which would lead them to look down on priests with visible imperfections, when it was necessary for them to hold the tabernacle in reverence, or because it's a human document reflecting the bias and limitations of the time, even if it was written by people who had a theophany, a divine encounter, who in other places in the text record a depth of insight and wisdom only possible from that kind of godly inspiration. Either way, the limitations or quote unquote imperfections of humanity make their way into the surface meaning of the text. And as you said, Ari, the true imperfection is bias. And here's what's ironic. An essential message of Judaism is that things are not always as they seem. That the surface appearance of things is not the whole story. For example, Judaism teaches that all of the disparate forces in the natural world come from a single invisible source one God. That's our big innovation. Even forces that seem to be in opposition from each other, such as the sun and the rain, are underneath it all one. The mightiest human powers who may seem to control our lives or the fate of the world, such as the pharaohs or Nebuchadnezzar, are as nothing compared to the God of redemption, who can move them like puppets. Even the Torah itself is not to be read as its surface meaning alone, but instead we are to dig for layers beneath the surface, layers that may add new dimensions or even have contradictory meanings, hidden layers that may be held to be more true than the surface itself. That's how we approach Torah and the world. An example from this parasha, which, which devotes a lot of time to the holidays, of the year, it says, quote, the feast days of Adonai, which you shall declare to be days of holy gathering, these are my feasts. Well, so the rabbis don't just read that as an obvious statement about these holidays that are going to happen. They read it as a reference to the idea that the rabbinic courts and humans are going to decide the calendar because it says, you, which you shall declare to be days of holy gathering. You, the people, will declare what those days are. In other words, when they will be, based on when the new moon is, which you will discern and decide. And what the rabbis understand that to mean further is that it's through human action that the calendar is set, and not just that the calendar is set, but that God actually depends on human action for a lot of things. In Devarim Rabbah, the angels go to God and say, when is Rosh Hashanah? When is Yom Kippur? And God says to them, why are you asking me? You should go to the lower court, meaning the humans. And this, the rabbis say, is the foundation of the idea that God depends on humans to make the world as it should be. This is the foundation of the idea that we have in a lot of places in Judaism, that there's a partnership between God and humanity. This play between the surface of the text and its depths brings us to your teaching, Ilan, that the anti-Semitic libel 
that an eye for an eye is evidence of our vengefulness as a people comes out of a fundamental misunderstanding between Christianity and Judaism. In many denominations of Christianity, the Bible is read literally, taken as its surface meaning. Whereas all Jews, including Orthodox Jews, all Orthodox Jews know that we simply do not stop at the surface. It's just not how we do it. Instead, as Rashi and other rabbis tell us, we've never read an eye for an eye literally as its surface meaning. It's saying, as you taught us, that no matter how rich or poor you are, your eye is just as valuable as someone else's eye. It's about compensation for injury that takes into account and tries to level inequality. And that brings us to what your two divrei Torah have in common, the quest for equality, the end of bias in hiring and all aspects of society, the idea that a justice system should be just regardless of the wealth or the poverty of the parties involved. And this question of human equality is a fundamental concern of Judaism. Again, about the contrast between surface and reality. There are so many ways that human societies create hierarchies among people. We always have, and as you both taught us, we still do. But Judaism came to teach that surface inequality among humans is masking a deeper fundamental equality. I would like to apply this idea of surface versus depths to our confusing moment in this country. When it appears that we're moving backwards and having to refight old fights we already won on questions of equality. That we're having to reassert fundamental gender equality, for example, when we thought we had already established it. It is true and dispiriting that the imperative toward equality that we see reflected in the eye for an eye text continues to be unfulfilled. We continue to struggle with every aspect of equality among humans, whether that is by gender or race or economic standing or disability or sexual orientation or age, you name it. And from one perspective, it is unbelievable that we are still unable to claim victory on any aspect of that mandate from 2,500 years ago. Yet, the surface, the headlines, belie a forward motion that is both the cause of the backlash and undeterred by it. People will suffer and people will die because of the foolishness and recklessness of the United States Supreme Court's majority. It is no small matter. And that's why we're going to Washington on Tuesday as just one step of our response. And there are seats on that bus if you want to come. But we must not despair. Because in the great flow of time, equality is definitely winning. Even as we live in a gilded age with billionaires and oligarchs, even as a woman's right to control her own body is being withheld, even as state legislatures are scurrying to pass gag orders and book bans on everything from the existence of LGBT people to the true story of our nation's enslavement of millions of black people, it is vital that you not despair because consciousness continues to move forward and evolve. Look at the film Crip Camp. Did you see it? About a summer camp for disabled kids that became the breeding ground for the 20th century disability rights movement. It's taken thousands of years since the penning of Leviticus and the verses you criticize, Ari. But there is now a global disability rights movement. Look at the feminism and trans and queer positivity of Gen Z. The assumption among them of equality across gender. Look at the number of female leaders around the world, the life chances of girls and women and LGBT people. Nowhere near where they need to be, obviously, but never better. Look at the flowering of history and analysis and creativity and theory by black authors and artists and influencers, the Nicole Hannah Joneses and the Ibram Kendis. It is true that our country is divided and there are those who want to hide the past or turn back time, but it is nowhere near a majority. According to Nielsen ratings, about 1% of our country watch Fox News every day. 
According to polls, Fox viewers represent as much as 30% of our country. That is far from a majority. Yes, yes, hate and bias and the drive for inequality is often succeeding at winning elections and passing laws and placing justices on the Supreme Court. And it matters to millions of real lives today and in the generations to come. But it is also not the whole story. And when we look deeper, when we, will, we see that even the Trump years brought some of the greatest advancements in the consciousness of our country, not because of him, let's be clear. We see that regardless of conditions at the polls, in the legislatures, in the courts, we continue to move forward in our consciousness about the equality of humans. And that is why this backlash is so powerful. They are fighting for a dying world order. They are desperate and they're doing everything they can to hold on. And it is ugly and it will be ugly. It doesn't mean that we do any less to fight the fights over law, over policy, over access, over funding. It does mean that we can continue to hope and trust and believe and know that we are moving toward greater equality even when in the short term and on the surface, we are not. A few years ago, I read in a piece by Michelle Alexander a quote that I've brought here a couple of times from civil rights hero Vincent Harding, who said that the long, continuous yearning and reaching toward freedom flows throughout history like a river, sometimes powerful, tumultuous, and roiling with life, at other times meandering and turgid, covered with the ice and snow of seemingly endless winters, but always flowing. The fights are real. The fights matter. Lives are at stake. And it depends on us because we're in a true partnership with God. But no, as you are fighting the Jewish fight for equality among humans, you can trust that world history and human history is moving with you. God, according to Torah, is on the side of that great flow toward the dignity and equality of all humanity. May it come in our day. Shabbat Shalom.